Okay, hi folks. We're back and we're talking more about diffusion. And in particular, we're going to start looking at one of the best known models in the literature on diffusion, which is known as the BAS model. And it's been used quite extensively, especially in marketing and trying to understand things. So we've gone through some questions in background. And uh, we're going to start with the BAS model. And one thing about the BAS model is networks are not going to make an explicit appearance here. We're just going to have social interaction in the background. And after we've looked at the BAS model, then we'll enrich the analysis by bringing interaction structure in explicitly and trying to understand how things diffuse over time. Okay, so why is the BAS model interesting? Um, it's a benchmark model. It gives us a very stark and simple structure which uh, can begin to produce things like the S shapes that we saw before. And there's going to be two actions, behaviors, or states. So either you're not infected or you are, or you're not adopting a new product you're, or you are. Um, and what the BAS model will keep track of is over time, what's the fraction of individuals who have adopted, uh, take, take in action one, by time t. Okay? And in this model, you move from state zero to state one. You don't move back. So everybody starts in state zero. Then people start moving towards state one. Some fraction of the people can move to state one, and that will just move over time, and we'll just keep track over time of how many people have now moved to state one. So they've seen a movie, or they've adopted corn, or they have uh, caught the flu, etc. Okay, so it's a one-way street, and uh, we keep track of that over time. Okay, two key parameters in the BAS model. Um, P is going to be a rate of spontaneous innovation or adoption. So that's going to be a rate that's independent of what else is going on in the economy or the world or the society. So some people will just go and decide to see a movie regardless of what's going on or they'll adopt corn regardless of whether other people are doing it or they've heard about it, etc. And there's some other individuals who will actually do it as a function of having heard about it or um, uh, somehow... Um, imitated other individuals who are doing it. So there's these two parameters, P and Q, and the BAS model basically boils down then to a, a, a simple um, uh, equation which keeps track of the differential of the uh, fraction of people who have adopted uh, at time t as t varies. Okay, so how is this changing with time? Well, there's two parts to it. So at any point in time, they're um, the people who haven't yet adopted. So these are the people who have not yet adopted, yet moved to one, right? So they haven't become a one yet, so they're still zeros. So one minus FT are the people who are still zeros and can possibly change. And then the fraction of those people who change, well, some of them change directly, spontaneously. That's the P. And the others change by imitating the existing population. So you also you have a chance of, of just spontaneously deciding to become a one, or you also have a chance of uh, imitating somebody in the population, and that's proportional to how many in the population are already ones. So this Q parameter says that you have some rate of imitation. These are the ones existing. This is your imitation. And so this is the probability that you end up adopting one due to some imitation. This is the chance that you do it spontaneously, and these are the fraction of people who have not yet adopted and could make that change. So that gives us an expression for the differential over time. Very simple and intuitive model in terms of its uh, uh, basic uh, building blocks. Okay, so when we look at this, um, if you want to solve this expression, Right? And then you can start with an initial condition of uh, f of 0 equals 0. If you solve that, you get a simple equation for what f of t looks like. And it depends on, on p and q, obviously. Um, and so higher p's and q's are going to lead to faster diffusion, so more people adopting by any particular time. Lower p's and q's are going to lead to lower adoption rates. And so this thing will be increasing in p and increasing in q. Um, uh, at any point in time, the number of people that have adopted by that time. Okay, so you get a simple solution. And then let's look at some of the uh, aspects of this and, and why the model has been so well used and, and is well known. Okay, so um, first thing is that it's going to end up giving uh, an S shape if Q is bigger than P. 
Um, it's going to tend to 1 in the limit as t becomes large. Um, and basically what's going on in this model is initially only, the only way that people can adopt it, it's mainly going to be through p, and then eventually q is going to become the important parameter. Um, and uh, things will slow down um, as your a fraction of people that have adopted eventually reaches 1. So if we go back and uh, um, look at exactly what this equation looks like, let's try and analyze this in a little more detail and try and understand why we get interesting dynamics out of this. Okay, so first of all, when ft gets close to 1, this thing's going to have to slow down. And so what happens is the, the rate at which you're gaining new people uh, adopting, um, as f of t gets close to 1, this thing gets close to 0, right? And so this thing has to get close to 0. So this thing's going to tend to 0 um, as ft gets close to 1. So eventually it has to slow down just because the fraction of people who haven't adopted yet becomes small. So even if a lot of them are adopting, there's just not many of them left, and that's what gives you the last part of the curve. So that's very intuitive, and it's coming directly out of the, the limitation that this thing has to converge at most to 1. Um, when you're initially at 0, then uh, this part is going to go to 0, right? So there's no imitation going on because there's nobody to imitate, and everything is just happening from the spontaneous adopters. So initially, this thing is going to, this thing is going to look like 1. Everybody can still adopt, but all of it's going to happen through the P. So what starts out is you start out with a slope of p, right? So you start out with some initial um, ad adoption rate from 0. You're going to start out at a slope of p, and then eventually the q is going to start kicking in. So as you get more and more people adopting here, then the q can kick in, and that can begin to, to give you the s-shape. So the idea can be that the s-shape can start going up as q begins to kick in as more people start imitating. But there's, there's a competing factor, which is as more people are adopting, this thing is also going down, right? So you've got fewer people left to adopt. So whether or not you get this S shape is going to be a race between the increase in Q and the decrease in the population that's left. And eventually we know it has to, to, to asymptote and, and be concave. And so the question is whether it's going to be initially um, convex. Okay? And so when we can, we can analyze that, by looking at this process close to zero, we know that the initial slope is, is p. So let's look at, at what happens with some small epsilon. So we've, we've just started moving out, and we'll see whether we're going to start accelerating or not. Is it accelerating, or is it going to be already decreasing in speed? So what does dfdt look like at, at some small epsilon? It's going to look like p plus q epsilon times 1 minus epsilon. So if you just plug in a small epsilon for this, you get this. To a need to get the initial convexity, you need this thing to be bigger than p, right? We have to be accelerating. The, the slope started out at p. Now we have to be getting a slightly larger slope. So initially, to get that s shape, we're going to have to have this be bigger than p. And what does that tell us? Um, that tells us basically that uh, um, Q is going to have to be bigger than P. So for very small epsilon, the only way that you can have this thing be bigger than P is to have Q be bigger than P. So if Q is bigger than P, um, then you'll get that uh, effectively um, the Q, Q epsilon is going to be bigger than the, the P epsilon, um, and so we end up with uh, um, uh, a situation where you get the convex initial um, condition. So Q bigger than P gives us the initial growth, where we get a convexity at the um, beginning. Okay, so we get this S shape here. If P is bigger than Q, we get initially the, the slope is P, then it starts accelerating, and eventually when F of T gets very large, it's going to have to uh, slow down because now there's just not many adopters left, and then things slow down and we eventually get an asymptote towards 1. Okay, so that's the BAS model. Um, very compact, simple, easy model. Um, the, the, this model has been used quite extensively. Why has it been used so extensively? Um, it's, it's very compact. So if you can begin, you know, so suppose that we've, we were, we're just here at some time period, um, that's already enough to estimate what P was and to begin to see, to estimate what Q is. 
So as this process takes off, you don't need much data to begin to analyze and form estimates of P and Q. Once you've got estimates of P and Q, you can get estimates of what the rest of the process is going to look like. So this model has been used extensively in forecasting by trying to estimate from initial uh, take up. So if you look, say, at the box office of a new movie, how many people go see the movie in the first week? How many people go see the movie in the second week? Based on that first week and second week, you've already got a piece of the uh, uh, two pieces of this curve. You can begin to project how long is it going to take for this thing to keep uh, you know, to slow down, and, and where will it eventually reach in terms of its uh, um, asymptoting? So the BAS model has been enriched a lot by adding in extra moving parts. Maybe some people wouldn't see the movie. So here this assumes it goes up to 100%. Maybe some people would never see a certain movie. Um, you can enrich it by you know, adding in different kinds of heterogeneity and so forth. So there's different ways to enrich this model. And uh, people use richer versions of the BAS model for forecasting. But this, this basic simple part gives us that S shape in a very simple way. And we realize that you know, it, it's this combination of social imitation which grows with time, which gives us that um, convexity, which is important here. Okay, beyond the, the BAS structure, um, what we're going to look at next is um, component structures and start bringing the network in. So here, you know, more generally, the reach of diffusion is going to be bounded by some component structure. So if, if there's certain groups of people that don't interact with others, then uh, you know, things aren't going to move across one group. Um, it could be that some players or, or nodes are immune. So if we're talking about the flu, people could be, have a vaccine against it and maybe not catch it. Or it could be that you know, there's certain individuals who just wouldn't go see a certain kind of movies, that will never see a horror movie. And, and so you could think of them as being immune to certain kinds of diffusion. Um, it might be that some relationships between individuals uh, are transmitting with higher probability than others. So if we start looking at the network structure, we're going to see that, the, that there could be some probabilistic transmission. Um, so the answers of questions of when we get diffusion and its extent aren't answered so easily by the simple BAS model, and we'll have to enrich these kinds of diffusion models in order to answer those. And so that's what we'll take a look at um, next.